I originally gave this talk at a Russia Christie meeting at uh, Texas A&M in fall of 2023. Unfortunately, the recording did not go very well, and so I'm making another one um, of my research talk, which I titled Mental Trauma and the Threat of Hell, Finding Healing on a Historical Tour at tour of the afterlife. <clears throat> so, my disclosures, the ideas presented here, are my own views and not that of anyone else, and if I'm citing sources, that does not mean that I necessarily uh, agree with all, the, with all of the ideas that are in those sources. So, the motivation for my research is that dismantling toxic uh, conceptions of hell is a crucial step for someone who is healing from trauma that is related to the afterlife. And oftentimes, a deeper and more nuanced understanding of the historical development of conceptions of, of hell can facilitate healing for people who are experiencing this sort of, of a trauma. And so, I actually will not talk a lot about trauma until the end, I mainly want to provide historical data, um, not to impose any sort of religious beliefs or, or lack of beliefs, but to give people um, the most advanced research in this area and to let them uh, take that information and uh, help them find healing from their trauma in, uh, in whatever way uh, that is. So the methodology that I adopt, um, I like to summarize it, is data over dogma. And the historical critical method is, this, is the standard method that is used within the academic study of, um, of the Bible. <clears throat> and this method <coughs> excuse me, basically states that the meaning of texts is determined by the original historical, social, literary, and linguistic context. Um, and, what, and what that means, or the a uh, correlate of that, is that church tradition and mythology, later theologians, etc., are not part of the original context uh, in 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 which these texts were composed, and thus these later traditions do not contribute anything to our understanding or the meaning of these texts. And oftentimes, as I hope I will, I will show, that a lot of the toxic conceptions of, of hell are human traditions that did not develop until after the, after the uh, biblical period. And so just as kind of a historical background, I will first talk about the the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Old Testament and its ancient West Asian context. And in here you are looking at texts that were composed um, in the largely in the first millennium BCE. I will then jump um, forward to the New Testament, <clears throat> which um, usually scholars will say that the, the texts were mostly composed in the uh, late 1st century CE. And, and I will be contextualizing the New Testament in light of its historical context, which is early Judaism, so from about you know, 300 BCE to 200 CE. And there are several bodies of texts that are not considered uh, canonical or authoritative for, for Christians, um, <clears throat> or that are authoritative for certain Christian uh, traditions, but not for others. So, for example, the Deuterocanon is um, <clears throat> is authoritative for Catholics. Um, the Protestants call these texts uh, apocrypha, and they are not. <clears throat> we also have uh, other texts known as the Pseudepigrapha, um, Dead, Dead Sea Scrolls, and other texts, too. So, going on to kind of the organization of this, <coughs> excuse me, a historical tour of the afterlife, um, I've organized it according to three research gaps that I think help to um, kind of encompass the, the primary historical issues. And 
the first one that I want to to talk about is that if you read through this through the secondary um, literature on conceptions of the afterlife in the Hebrew Bible, you will often hear it said that there is no hell um, or heaven in the Hebrew Bible. That everyone dies, um, and whether you're righteous or you're wicked, everyone goes um, to the same sort of dreary. Um, dreary underworld that is known as Sheol. However, more recent research, I'd say within the last 25 to, <coughs> excuse me, 30 years, has, I think, thoroughly challenged that, uh, that model of ancient Israelite, um, thoughts about the afterlife. And so, that is the, that more recent research is what I will share. So briefly, I want to show you that this is ancient Israel on the coast of the Mediterranean, and ancient West Asia is its historical context. So we have ancient Egypt, um, Mesopotamia over here, as well as the the Hittites, which are in modern day Turkey, and then the Canaanites are just north of ancient Israel. So the most um, overarching theme for how ancient West Asian people thought about the afterlife was that the, the uh, memory of a deceased person amongst their living kin, friends, as well as deities is what sustains the spirit of the deceased in the underworld. And so, for ancient people, there were several mechanisms for how to preserve the deceased memory beyond death. And these include proper burial and funerary rites, as well as invoking the name of the, of the uh, deceased person. You, we also have extensive evidence of ongoing post-mortem care via food and, drink offer, food and drink offerings that are usually provided by the offspring of the deceased person. Um, <clears throat> and so here, I, I, I do think it is important to distinguish between this phenomenon that scholars call caring for the dead and necromancy. So necromancy is about soliciting forbidden knowledge from the deceased, whereas caring for the dead is about sustaining someone's memory beyond death. And the, this important distinction, I think, is most... Uh, most thoroughly addressed in this PhD thesis that came out of Brown in 2017. Um, another mechanism for preserving someone's memory beyond death is by setting up um, memorial steles and monuments for the deceased. And finally, the literary or research output of a deceased person or written texts um, written texts about someone who has passed on. These are all ways that ancient people sought to preserve the, the memory of, uh, of the dead and thus to sustain people um, in the underworld. <clears throat> and so kind of as a, <coughs> excuse me, as the flip side of this and talking about what is the bad afterlife in ancient Israel is the, the deprivation of these conditions endangers the deceased to restlessness, isolation from their ancestors and friends um, in the afterlife, and eventually the spirit of the deceased just fades out and they cease to exist. So for those who are more graphically inclined, I've pulled this figure out of a research paper that came out of a top journal um, of the Hebrew Bible, Vetus Testamentum, in 2019. And that kind of just summarizes what, what I just told you about, is that when someone has a, a, a good death, they have proper burial, they are cared for by their descendants, their memory is being preserved beyond death, they have a restful, um, a restful afterlife. Whereas <clears throat> deprivation of burial, um, not being cared for, being being uh, being forgotten, um, leaves someone in a state of bad death, restlessness, um, in the afterlife, and then eventually the spirit of the deceased just fades out. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, and so what is interesting is that when we look at our ancient West Asian sources, this rhetoric of a death, uh, desecration, which this term was coined um, in this PhD thesis that came out in, in uh, 2015, where desecrating someone's memory and rhetoric associated with it, it becomes a metonymy for a bad afterlife fate. So, for example, if you were reading through an ancient West Asian text, and it says something like, may your corpse not be buried, and may you not have offspring, what that curse is actually saying is, may your spirit be restless, and may it eventually be wiped out. So I've chosen two representative data points um, in our ancient West Asian sources, one from ancient Egypt and another from Mesopotamia. <clears throat> and so this is an, 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 uh, a curse that was written on an ancient Egyptian monument, and it is trying to di uh, dissuade people from erasing this, um, or from from either erasing or damaging this monument, because that would be um, a violation of one's memory. And so this curse is kind of a, it's kind of in a tit-for-tat sort of format of um, if if someone violates this monument, this is the curse. He, he will not be buried in the West, which refers to the underworld, and their flesh shall burn together with that of the criminal, so they haven't been turned into ones who do not exist, so they receive the annihilation. <clears throat> he shall be an enemy of the glorified spirits. His memory shall not be among those living on earth. The water shall not be poured for him. Offerings shall not be given to him. And so here I've deliberately chosen this text from ancient Egypt because you have all those elements that I uh, that I sketched out. There's deprivation of burial, the violation of one's corpse, the wiping out of one's memory, the, the uh, deprivation of food and, and uh, drink offerings, and finally the complete uh, destruction of the spirit in the afterlife. So going on to some other data points, I pulled these from, this is from a series of incantations against witches, um, the, the Maklu series, it dates to the early first millennium BCE, and we have uh, some interesting rhetoric, so we have this curse um, against a, a witch, may eagle and vulture prey on your corpse, may silence and shivering fall upon you. May dogs tear you apart, um, tear apart your flesh. <clears throat> and then we have dissolve, melt, drip ever away. May your smoke, which refers to the destroyed ghost, rise ever heavenward. May the sun extinguish your embers. May the son of Ea, who is a, a god, the exorcist, cut off your uh, emanations. And so here, Dr. Abouche, who specializes in research in uh, Mesopotamian magic, he explains that thus by burning her, the, the body of the witch or feeding it to animals, the witch is deprived of burial and is annihilated. The body is destroyed and, and her ghost is no more. And so, of course, this is the whole entire logic of these uh, of these spells is that you want to destroy the spirit of this witch so that she can't strike out from beyond the grave. And so moving into our texts from the, from the Hebrew Bible, do we have any evidence that people in ancient Israel thought similarly? <clears throat> and it turns out that we have uh, several uh, several examples that I have pulled. <clears throat> so this one, <coughs> excuse me, um, comes out of Jeremiah chapter 7, and essentially some uh, ancient Judahites, so people who were living in ancient Israel, um, they were going, they were sacrificing their own children to a deity who was uh, associated with the underworld, Molech, and so they went down into this valley, the valley 
of um, of ge Gehenome, um, which that will be a relevant term later. Uh, so so these 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 people go down into this valley, and they're sacrificing their their children. And so God is very angry about this, and so he he speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, he issues this curse against these people. And so he says, and the, the dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth, and none will frighten them uh, away. And so this is a striking resemblance that we just saw in the Maklu series, right? If we go back, may, may eagle and vulture prey on your corpse, may dogs um, tear apart your flesh. This, this imagery of depriving someone of burial, they're not being remembered in, in death, <clears throat> refers to the annihilation of their, of their spirits. And if we go on and keep on reading, then we read the bones of the kings of Judah, the bones of, of its officials, the bones of, its, of, of the priests, the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be brought out of their tombs, and they shall be spread before the, the sun, and they shall not be gathered or buried. <coughs> Excuse me. And so... What we see in this text is that specifically very egregiously bad Judahites, they're sentenced to die in the netherworld, which this valley of Ge Gehenom is associated with the underworld, and their spirits will be consigned to restlessness, but not for not for an, an endless duration. Eventually, the spirits pass out of um, out of existence. And so the second text that I have pulled comes out of Isaiah 66. Um, this is kind of a, a final restoration of the cosmos as well as judgment um, on those specifically who have rebelled um, uh, against God, but who also uh, seem to have persecuted those who were, who were trying to be faithful to uh, God. And so what's interesting is that this rhetoric of, of preserving, uh, preserving people's memory, we see it in Isaiah 66. So for those who are, who are faithful to, uh, to God, <clears throat> so shall your offspring and your name remain. And so remember that offspring are a mechanism of preserving someone's memory. And one's name refers to one's personhood. Um, whereas those who were rebellious and who were egregiously bad, um, it is said that they, referring to those who are faithful to God, they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. And so it's very interesting because you have... Uh, corpses that are exposed, um, that are rotting, and that are burned up. Um, and so, if we remember back to the ancient uh, Egyptian curse, exposing someone's corpse and burning it leads to the spirit being destroyed. <clears throat> So what is interesting is that those who are faithful to God, they are gathering to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. Um, and it is said in, uh, at the end of, of Isaiah 66 that, that they're looking out on the corpses of those who were very bad, essentially. And so what is interesting is that the actual uh, geography around Jerusalem, so if you go to Mount Zion, which is in Jerusalem, and you're looking out, then you're looking out into the valley of Gehenom, which was that same valley that we saw back in Jeremiah um, chapter 7 that is associated with the underworld. And so you have corpses that are exposed, people are dying in this valley that is associated with, it, with, the, uh, with the underworld, and their spirits are consigned to be restless, but not forever, in the absolute sense, eventually their spirits will be annihilated. 
And so there's another vignette that, um, in the Hebrew Bible that I wanted to share, and that God is portrayed as a beneficent caregiver for the vulnerable dad. And so the example that I pulled comes out of the book of, of, of a Kings in the Hebrew Bible. So there was a very bad king, Jeroboam, who led Israel to worship idols, to do a bunch of uh, terrible things, basically. When his son falls ill, he, he, uh, <clears throat> he uh, goes to the prophet uh, named uh, Hijah, who pronounces an, an uh, oracle against him, because basically he's been doing all these terrible things. And so he says, anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, dogs shall eat, and anyone who, who dies in the open country, birds of the heavens shall eat. Um, but then, when he's discussing Jeroboam's child who has fallen ill, um, he says, when your feet enter the city, the child shall die, and all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there was found something pleasing to the Lord. <clears throat> so what is very interesting about, about this particular case is that Jeroboam and most of his male relatives who were all in on this oppressive, um, terrible, uh, terrible, uh, Dynasty, <clears throat> they are condemned. To, um, their spirits will be restless, and eventually they will be uh, destroyed. <clears throat> However, Jeroboam's ill male child, he will eventually not have any relatives to preserve his his uh, memory beyond death, and so it kind of raises <coughs> excuse me a question about what what will God do for this child who who, who doesn't have anyone to preserve his uh, memory beyond death, and because he's dying as a child, he doesn't have any, any, um, any offspring of his own. And so what God does is that by securing the child's burial by proxy, it's almost like God assumes the mantle of next of kin, and he provides a, a path to a restful um, afterlife fate. And what is so interesting in this case is that there is no mention of any profession of faith by this child. Um, after all, he's only a, a kid and probably he doesn't have the, have the ability to really make any sort of uh, religious uh, commitment. <clears throat> but all that we're told is that God finds something pleasing in, in his character. <clears throat> And so here, I kind of want to summarize with some more theologically oriented um, observations of our data. And one is that only very egregiously bad people are are um, are sentenced to a re to a restless um, afterlife state, and then eventually their spirits just fade out. Um, and I've listed some of the examples here of. Yeah, criminals, malevolent witches, Israelites are promoting the worship of a, of an idol amongst the Israelites. So it isn't, you know, anybody and everybody who is worshiping... <coughs> excuse me. It's not anybody and everybody who's worshiping idols. It's specifically Israelites who have made a commitment that they're going to worship God alone and that somehow through them and their relationship with God, that that's God's uh, rescue plan for the whole entire world. Um, people who are sacrificing their, their, their uh, children and people who are actively fighting against God and his people. So it's not people who are apathetic, it's not people who, who haven't heard, you know, about God or, uh, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and after doing this research and, and looking through all of the examples of where we see this rhetoric of death, uh, the desecration. <clears throat> there, there is no example of someone, um, <coughs> excuse me, being sentenced to a bad, uh, to a bad uh, afterlife fate merely for not worshiping God. There's just no, there is no data for that. Um, and what this means is that presumably, as long as someone is remembered beyond death. 
they can have a restful afterlife with their family and friends. And based on that example that I gave in First Kings, it is apparent that God can step in in certain special cases. And the example that I gave was a child dying young to make sure someone is is um, m memorialized beyond death. So I kind of made like a little graphic here as a summary of how ancient Israelites thought about the afterlife. Um, and so you have physical death. <coughs> Excuse me. When people's memory is uh, preserved by either humans or a god, there is a restful, disembodied um, afterlife state. <coughs> um, we do have a vague notion of resurrection and an embodied existence on a renewed earth in the kind of distant future, and that is associated with people who are loyal to God. Um, but the fate of everyone else is really just hazy. We aren't told a lot of questions that we, that we want to know, such as what happens, this kind of neutral dead category of whenever, you know, eventually everyone is forgotten beyond death. And so <coughs> kind of presents a, a, a problem. Um, but it's not entirely clear from our sources of um, about how the afterlife journey works. It's it's never spelled out or like explained in any sort of systematic way. Um, what I think is clear is that for for the bad afterlife, um, is that it's it's for people who are egregiously bad. So it's not anybody and everybody who doesn't believe something. It's egregiously bad people. There's restless isolation from their kin and friends. And you get the impression that their spirit will fade out relatively quickly. So we don't have the impression that people are wandering restlessly for eons and eons and eons. Um, the example that we looked at was the Maklu series of incantations, where the whole entire logic of that text is that the spirit of the witch will be, will be wiped out soon, so, so that she can't strike out from beyond death. So now I'm going to proceed to our New Testament texts. So recall that now we're fast forwarding to the late first century CE. And the context for understanding our New Testament texts is early Jewish texts, which I will touch on. Um, so the second um, kind of research gap that we're going to talk about is where does the New Testament quote-unquote hell um, uh, imagery come from? And surprise, surprise, it comes from the sociocultural milieu of the New Testament, i.e. Second Temple Judaism. So this time period that is here of the Second Temple from like about the turn of the 6th century BCE all the way until the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE. <clears throat> so this time period, as well as the Hebrew Bible, which is earlier, that is the context. <clears throat> so we're just going to jump right in to one of Jesus' parables. Um, this, is, this comes out of Matthew 25, late 1st uh, century CE. Uh, this is a Excuse me. This is a final judgment scene. So notice how this is different. Whereas before, in the in in the in the Hebrew Bible, judgment was beyond death, but it seems to be quite rapid. But now we have this final judgment scene that is that is at the end of a time. And so Jesus tells the story of the parable of the sheep and the goats, which an to kind of take a step back here to talk about um, mental trauma is that uh, when people experience trauma, it is often through people weaponizing certain biblical texts, and this is one of them, in order to to cause fear and to control people. But when we scrutinize the, these texts more more closely and put them into their original context, a lot a lot of the assumptions of people in more fundamentalist uh, settings. They just don't hold up to the actual data, um, and I think this is a great example 
Um, so Jesus is telling this story, and it's kind of this vignette of the final judgment scene. And so you have a son of man figure <clears throat> who is basically Jesus, and he's seated on his glorious throne. <coughs> Excuse me. On his right um, is a is a group that are that are um, represented as sheep, and they are said to inherit the the kingdom. They have um, everlasting life, and the basis of this blessing is quite interesting because beliefs are not mentioned. Um, it's said that um, caring for the basic needs of quote unquote the least of these my my brothers, that that is the basis of this. And this group of the least of these, my my brothers, it is presumably people who are loyal to, to, to Jesus, because they are brothers of, of Jesus. There's some sort of relational connection there. Um, and presumably they are included among the, the sheep, but they seem to be the most vulnerable. And so... The implication seems to be that those who are really, who those who are truly loyal to Jesus, that they will care for those who are vulnerable, um, specifically amongst those who are brothers of of uh, Jesus. <coughs> On Jesus' left side, um, we have a group of people that are described as goats. And their sentence is to, quote-unquote, de depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And there's mention of uh, e eternal punishment, as it gets translated, excuse me. <clears throat> um, and so, of course, this can be a very traumatizing text. Um, but what is so interesting is that the basis of this sentence is not people's beliefs. Um, but beliefs <coughs> are not mentioned. In fact, the basis of the sentence is not caring for the basic needs of, quote-unquote, the least of, of these. And so, if we kind of zoom out and think about it, and Jesus, as he's, uh, and Matthew, who is... Um, purporting to uh, record what Jesus said is that most people in the first century CE don't even fall into either of these two groups. So if you if you think about it, most people in the first century CE didn't even know anything about who Jesus was, um, and so they're not the the least of these my my, my brothers. Most people in the first century CE had no access to any of Jesus' followers, and so there, there was not even any, um, any way for them to be caring for the basic, uh, for the basic needs of Jesus' followers. <clears throat> On the flip side, <coughs> um, people, uh, those were those who are uh, described as goats, they are depicted as denying basic needs um, to the least of, of these. And the basic needs that are listed is caring for those who are uh, in a prison. I, I believe those who are sick and those who don't have, I think, food or clothing or something like that. And so it's very fascinating because this text doesn't seem to be interested in the fate of of like every last person who is who has you know died, and what is their fate at the final judgment scene. We have this this vignette of people who were uh, condemned because they don't care about those who are vulnerable and specifically those who are associated with Jesus, <clears throat> but. What are they condemned to? That's kind of a question, right? Because we like, see that this rhetoric of uh, of fire and punishment, um, where does that imagery come from? And so to answer that question, we have to go back in time a little bit to a text known as uh, as the parables of Enoch. 
and this text dates to the late 1st century BCE and perhaps into the early 1st century CE. So it predates or perhaps is uh, contemporary, contemporary with the Gospel of Matthew, which we just looked at. Um, <clears throat> and so it's very fascinating because if we just read through this text, um, it, it, it goes like this. And he, which refers to the, to the Son of Man figure, he sat on the throne of his glory, and the whole judgment w was given to the Son of Man. And he'll make sinners vanish and perish from, from the face of the earth. And those who led astray the world, which this refers to the fallen angels of Genesis 6, will, will be bound in chains, and in the assembly place of their destruction, they will be shut up and all their works will, will vanish from the face of the earth. And from then on, there will be, there will be nothing that is corrupt, corruptible. For that Son of Man has appeared, and he, and he has sat down on the throne of his glory. Sound familiar? <clears throat> and all evil will vanish from his presence. And so, <clears throat> if Jesus and Matthew either knew directly about the parables of Enoch, or at the very least were, were aware of common, um, common certain stock, uh, stock phrases and, uh, and imagery, <clears throat> then the, then, then the implication, <coughs> excuse me, is that the eternal punishment that Jesus mentions does not refer to endless suffering, but to annihilation, just like here, evil vanishes and perishes, which which is indeed a a permanent um, a permanent uh, punishment. So, what about Jesus' phrase in his parable um, to the goats to depart from me? Um, there's also a parallel also in, in, in the parables of Enoch. <clears throat> so I do want to highlight of who is being sentenced. Is it everybody who doesn't believe something, or who doesn't, you know, who doesn't act, uh, you know, who, who doesn't act a certain way? Um, no, it is specifically those who are egregiously bad. So we're told it's the kings and, and the mighty and the exalted, and those who rule the land. Um, and the specific vice that they're called out for is actually down here. For the iniquity that they did to his children and his and his chosen ones. Um, so basically God's children and his, uh, though, <coughs> excuse me. So, this is not anybody and everybody who, who doesn't believe something. It's specifically those who are persecuting people who are trying to be loyal to God. And part, part of their sentence is that the Lord of Spirits, which is a title for, for God, himself will press them so that they will hasten to depart from his presence, just like Jesus' statement. What about the phrase... Uh, eternal fire in Matthew 25. Do we have anything within our, our early, early Jewish texts that parallels that? And it turns out that we do. Um, it comes out of the rule of the community. This um, dates to about 175 BCE. <clears throat> it's amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in the, um, in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And so there's a series of curses that are pronounced against the <coughs> excuse me, against the lot of Belial, which is basically Satan's team. And it, it is said that they are cursed without mercy for, for, um, for the darkness of your deeds and sentenced to the gloom of everlasting fire. But the everlasting fire does not... Um, what does that mean? And if we keep reading for just seven lines later, we are told, however, his spirit will be uh, obliterated. The, the dry with the moist, i.e. completely, this is an allusion to 
the book of Deuteronomy and the Hebrew Bible mercilessly. May God's anger and the wrath of his verdicts consume him for everlasting destruction. So this is um, a curse that is uttered against someone who is basically trying to to, to join the uh, community, but who is harboring ways that are considered sinful to this particular sect. Um, but what is interesting is that everlasting fire, everlasting destruction, is apparently synonymous with the spirit being destroyed completely. So we don't have endless suffering, we have permanent, uh, permanent uh, destruction of the spirit of the deceased person. So now I'm going to go on to another one of Jesus' parables, one that is can be weaponized by people in order to um, to cause uh, trauma that is related to conceptions of, of postmortem punishment. And so Jesus told, tells a parable, it's kind of like a, a fable about a rich man and uh, a poor man named Lazarus. And this comes out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. So you have lives of of two Jewish men. Um, the the rich man he enjoys a lavish lifestyle, but he he never cares about those who are poor. And specifically, one of his neighbors is Lazarus, who is poor, homeless, and sickly, and who lives at the rich man's gate. Um, and the rich man he is aware of Lazarus, but he won't even give him the the scraps from from uh, from his banqueting table. And so both of these men die in this story, and in the afterlife there is a reversal of, of fates. And so Lazarus is comforted at, at um, Abraham's side, or Abraham's bosom, as it's sometimes uh, translated. <clears throat> and there's this great chasm um, and on the other side of this chasm, there is the, the rich man who is in quote uh, anguish in in the flames of Hades. <clears throat> and so Hades just refers to the underworld broadly speaking. And so it just specifies that they are they are both of them are in Hades in the sense that both of them are are in the underworld. But the rich man, he is experiencing punishment after death. Um, but notice, <coughs> excuse me, that once again, condemnation in the afterlife is not associated with just beliefs. Um, in fact, both these men are Jewish. It, it is about how you how, how you treat people. Um, and so there's there's this kind of uh, dialogue in Jesus' story that he tells, and the rich man, he calls out across this chasm to Abraham, and he wants Abraham to command Lazarus to dip his finger in cool water to cool the rich man's burning tongue. And this is denied because of the, um, because of the, of the a great chasm, and it, 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 it is also said, um, or what Abraham says to the, to the rich man is basically, you had your your your, you you had your good things within life, um, and then now the roles are switched. Um, the rich man's second request is to once again to send Lazarus to warn his brothers who are who are still alive <coughs> about basically punishment. Um, in the afterlife, um, but this request is also denied. And what Abraham says is basically, if they won't respond to the ethical uh, admonitions of the Hebrew Bible, then they will not uh, repent, even if someone rises from the the dead. And at this point, this scene basically cuts. So, I want to make several important uh, observations about these um, about this story that Jesus tells. And one is that <coughs> excuse me, the condition of the rich man in Hades is never said to be endless. Um, all we're given is a brief 
vignette. We are also not told that that these two fates that were shown to us, um, either residing with um, with Abraham or Anguish and Hades, are the only two possible afterlife fates. Um, I think it's kind of helpful to think about this parable kind of like a Broadway musical in that it does not make any literal sense. Um, after all, people do not give long, drawn-out monologues while while they're being burned and tortured in, you know, any sort of horrible way, right? Um, but it's kind of like how for a Broadway musical, whenever people break out into spontaneous singing and dancing, we don't... We don't think that that is just silly, or um, we don't question it, right? Because we know this is, a, this is a Broadway musical, this is part of the art form. People break out into coordinated singing and dancing, and that's just part of the way that this medium of literary art works. <clears throat> and I think this parable is kind of similar in that, of course, someone who's actually being uh, tortured in some graphic way is not going to be t talking. Um, that is silly, right? <clears throat> um, I, do, I do think that Jesus is trying to get at something with his imagery of uh, suffering, but I don't think that he's trying to give us like video camera footage of it. I think that, that the anguish seems to be regret over one's life choices. So for the rich man, um, he was kind of... Uh, regretting uh, his life choices and, and realizing uh, that, that he really messed up and that he wants to warn his brothers um, not to make his same uh, choice that, that, uh, that he did. There also does seem to be some resentment. So I kind of highlighted of how the rich man, he doesn't even address Lazarus, but he addresses Abraham. He wants Abraham to order Lazarus around to just do things for him. And he still wants to, 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 to dominate those who he perceives as either vulnerable or as just worthless. And so I think that Jesus is actually doing something quite sophisticated in that he's portraying anguish but the anguish is something that is entirely self-induced, and res um, it arises from one's own just selfish and awful character. So kind of going on to, well, where does the afterlife um, imagery that we find in this parable, where does it come from? Are there any antecedents that we can... Uh, discern within our our early Jewish texts, and it turns out that we can, um, if we go back in time to the Book of the Watchers, which is part of First Enoch, which dates to the third century BCE. We have two um, uh, the the two afterlife compartments that we see in the uh, parable of the rich man and, and, and Lazarus have a striking resemblance to two out of the four different afterlife fates. So, those who are considered righteous, there is a restful afterlife with a spring of water and light. So, if you remember, what did the rich man ask uh, Lazarus to, to do? He asked him to dip his finger into cool water, right? Where, you know, why is, why is that particular, like, um, why is that image being used? And I think we have, um, a, a parallel here in the Book of the Watchers. There is another afterlife compartment down here for egregiously bad sinners who do not receive their due within life. Um... And so there is torment for the egregiously bad. Um, however, you have to be so bad that you did not get what you what you deserved within life. There was another category of people who were who were <coughs> excuse me who were labeled as godless, um, but who received their due within life. 
and there is no punishment after uh, after death. There's also a category of people who were wrongfully slain, and they call out for, for vengeance on those who had uh, killed them. Uh, there is a, a proleptic uh, reference to a final judgment at the end of a time, and uh, those who are in this righteous category, it seems that they will be resurrected to everlasting life, um, whereas those who were in the egregiously bad category, they are raised for judgment and destruction. Those who are who are in this category, it is said that there is no punishment and there is no resurrection at the end of, of, of a time. And so it's not really clear. They just are stuck in this underworld compartment and it's kind of just, we are told. Um, and then also for this category of those who were wrongfully slain, we just are told um, what happens to people in... Uh, in that afterlife space. So, if that's true, and that this is more complicated than just two afterlife fates, is there any evidence of a, of a partial uh, resurrection in the Hebrew Bible? And it turns out that I think that there is. Um, this is, comes out of the book of Daniel, which in its final form dates to the 2nd century BCE. And we are told that at the end of time, many, but not all, are risen from the, the dead. And so it says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting uh, contempt. And it's interesting because this term that gets translated to contempt, it is the same Hebrew word that was translated as... Uh, abhorrence in Isaiah 66 for the corpses that were uh, exposed. And so in Daniel 12, it seems that only those who are quote-unquote wise, so those who were uh, being faithful to a god, and the egregiously bad seem to be raised. Um, this is quite fascinating because th this is one of our earliest texts that mentions a, a resurrection and it is roughly uh, contemporaneous with the Enochic texts uh, in the 2nd century BCE. So what about in other places within Luke's Gospel? Is there any evidence for a partial and not a universal uh, resurrection of the dead? So. In Luke chapter 20, which is just four chapters after the parable of the rich man Lazarus, Jesus is disputing with the Sadducees, who do not believe in in any resurrection for anyone, whether you're righteous or you're bad, it doesn't matter. Um, and Jesus' response to them, as he's kind of engaging in a debate, as he says, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are, nor are given marriage. They cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and, and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But did you catch at this statement, those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from, from the dead, this implies that at least some people are not found worthy of the resurrection, and thus will not be resurrected for the uh, final judgment. So going on to the last book of the Christian Bible and the New Testament, of course we would not be able to finish looking at hell if we didn't journey to the book of Revelation. And so here we have a, a judgment scene where um, essentially Babylon is this archetype of evil nations. Um, Babylon is condemned 
Um, and then we are told if, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on its forehead or on its hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength in, in, uh, into the cup of his anger, and he'll be tormented with fire and sulfur in, in the presence of the holy angels and in, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of, the, of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshippers. Of, of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name so once again who is being targeted with the rhetoric is it anybody and and everyone who, who does not believe something no it is specifically those who are taking this mark which is a meaning of pledging allegiance to this beast and elsewhere um in the text um, this beast is said to persecute those who are being faithful to, to God. And so those who are condemned are specifically people who are persecuting um, those who are followers of the Lamb, who is Christ, basically. And so what about this imagery of fire and sulfur and smoke rising forever and not having rest day or, or a night? Are there any... Um, texts that the person who wrote uh, Revelation 14 that they are alluding to, and it turns out that there, are <clears throat> um, that there is one text that is very important for understanding this, and it comes out of Isaiah 34. And so here we have, this is a a, a judgment oracle against a nation that neighbored ancient Israel, Edom. And this nation basically took advantage of when ancient Israel was collapsing in the face of an invasion by Babylon. Edom came to basically uh, prey on those who were vulnerable. And so those who were refugees, they would capture them, kill them, hand, hand them over to become slaves to Babylon. So once again, this is not someone who is apathetic, who does not believe for whatever reason. It's specifically those who are egregiously bad and who are fighting against people who are trying to be loyal to, to God. And so in this judgment oracle, we have this imagery of streams of, of uh, Edom turning it into pitch and her soil into sulfur. And her land shall become burning pitch. Night and day it shall not be quenched. Its smoke sh shall go up forever. I think a better translation would be uh, continually or on and on. Um, because we know that historically Edom was destroyed and that today we, we still don't have smoke coming up out, out of Edom, right? You know, thousands and thousands of years later. And if we go on, we read from generation to generation, it it shall lie waste, none shall pass through it forever and ever. Um, it's noble, there is no one there to call it a, a kingdom, and all its princes shall be nothing. And so this imagery of fire and sulfur and smoke rising up, quote-unquote, forever, um, night and day it isn't quenched, this imagery doesn't mean endless suffering. It means a destruction that is permanent and that cannot be uh, undone or canceled. So what about the imagery associated with the destruction of Babylon? So remember that Babylon is this archetype of evil nations and she is condemned um, because basically Babylon is portrayed as this very violent um, and just a terrible place that abuses people um, and profits off of them. Um, and her condemnation is a is a like measure of torment and uh, mourning. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she'll be burned up with fire. So once again, burned up completely and destroyed, not tortured endlessly. And if we go on, then we have this uh, John who is uh, seeing these visions in the, uh, in the text. There's this angel who takes up a stone, 
like a great millstone and threw it, threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence, and will be found no more. And then once again, in chapter 19, once more they, which is the, the heavenly host, they're crying out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her, referring to Babylon, goes up forever and ever. And once again, the whole entire point is not that Babylon is being tortured for billions and billions of years later. The point is that she'll be found no more and destroyed. So, of course, um, a survey of conceptions of hell will not be complete without talking about the lake of fire and the second death. So, in the book of Revelation, we have imagery of uh, a great dragon, which is Satan. He summons a beast and then an, the false prophet out of a chaotic sea. They persecute those who are followers of, a, of a Jesus. This evil trio and their hordes are vanquished, and this evil trio are cast into the lake of fire to be tormented day and night, quote-unquote, forever and ever. I think a better translation would be on and on, as I uh, mentioned earlier. Then after this, personified death and Hades, which refers to the underworld, are also cast in, 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 uh, into the lake of fire. And finally, the, the dead are raised for judgment according to deeds, so beliefs are once again not mentioned, and those whose names are not in the, in, are not in the, in the Book of Life are cast in, into the lake of fire, which apparently equals the second death. And so a logical question to ask is, what is the end result of the lake of fire and the second death? And we are told, just like five verses later, in chapter 21, that death shall be no more. And so if that statement is true, then what happened to death in the lake of fire? Death was annihilated in the lake of fire, along with Satan, demons, the beasts, and anyone whose name was not found written in the Book of Life. <clears throat> And finally, there's one text in the last chapter of this book, and it kind of gives you the impression that maybe those who were excluded from, from, from the New Jerusalem, which is basically kind of like a heavenly paradise, um, <clears throat> it is said that out, outside of the city are the dogs, which is a metaphor for egregiously bad people, and sorcerers, and the sexually immoral, and murderers, and uh, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So I want to highlight that it's egregiously bad. It's not just someone who, who does not believe something. Um, and so those whose names were not written in the Book of Life, if they've already been annihilated in, in the Lake of Fire, then why are they being described as outside of the, of the New Jerusalem? Someone might get the impression that they're still suffering, right? But if we recall back to Isaiah 66, being excluded from the New Jerusalem ent entails being annihilated in the afterlife in Gehenna at, at the final judgment. And so I would argue that Revelation 22 recycles the imagery. And so if the idea of like an endless torture chamber doesn't come from our biblical text, then, then where does it come from for, for someone who has, exper who has experienced trauma? That would be a helpful way to, to, to find some closure. And so I agree with Dr. Ehrman in his little kind of summary that hell is hell, hell is Hellenistic. So the Hellenistic period, like basically, is whenever Greek culture starts to influence ancient Judaism. And this happens after the invasion of Alexander in the latter 4th century uh, BCE. 
and so he basically conquered most of the of the of the known world and with him he brings great culture philosophy as well as religious beliefs and so i've created this heat map of various conceptions of hell within our our early jewish texts um and if you notice there's only one text that i would say is a positive control for endless suffering and this is fourth maccabees which dates to the first and perhaps the early second century ce the rest overwhelmingly i would say attest to a belief that that during a final judgment that those who are egregiously bad or it kind of varies of who's targeted with the rhetoric of, of hell, that they are just wiped out. So thinking about the relationship of Hellenism and hell, for endless suffering to be a coherent idea, one must assume that the body and or the soul is inherently uh immortal which is not a view that we find in the hebrew bible which i hope i've shown you that and this idea that souls inherently cannot die is a hellenistic concept um it's known that plato he was a greek philosopher he was one of <coughs> excuse me that idea is associated with him and after the spread of hel uh, Hellenization, then we have the diffusion of Greek ideas and speculation about the, about the nature of a souls. And so I do think that it's important that our, early, our earliest Jewish and Christian sources, which attest that, um, to the idea of endless suffering, as well as graphic torments, uh, in the hell show very clear signs of Hellenistic uh, uh, Hellenistic uh, concepts basically <clears throat> so the example th that I mentioned earlier was in 4th Maccabees there's no bodily resurrection <coughs> excuse me there's also no final judgment at the end of time the focus is that souls are inherently immortal, and so they will spend forever and uh, either in bliss or in torment. Um, and a second example that I uh, th uh, that I came across during my research was that um, in the Apocalypse of Zephaniah, which dates to probably like the early second century CE, down here, um, it has graphic. Um, depictions of punishment in the afterlife, and it's interesting because the the punishing angels are described like the Furies from Greek myth. So they are they have f uh, feminine features. Um, they have like iron like tusks. Um, and most uh, kind of striking was that both of them weep uh, weep tears that are blood and it's like that's like a very specific like image <coughs> and i noticed it because within greek myth it's known that the that the furies that their tears are on blood uh, so this is just two examples that i came up with of very obvious signs of greek concepts that are diffusing into certain sectors of uh of of people who are jewish but who are assimilating basically um <clears throat> so now i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of fast forward in time um so i touched on some of our earliest evidence of the idea of endless suffering um but what about the very graphic um, very graphic depictions of torture within hell that we as Westerners are, are, like often think about within like um, medieval art and uh, certain texts like Dante's uh, in Inferno very graphic depictions of suffering and torture where does that come from 
Um, because often, <coughs> excuse me, those concepts are what cause people to have trauma. Um, but those beliefs and uh, those concepts about hell don't develop until actually after the new 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 Testament period. And where, where we first see the graphic depictions of, of imprisonment and torture, we see it within a certain genre of, of early Christian texts that are known as the early Christian tours of a hell. And what is so interesting is that um, the, the sorts of punishments are very characteristic of Roman ideas of crime and punishment and, and how punishment quote unquote fits the the crime. And that was mentioned <coughs> um, most recently in Dr. Henning's book that came out, um, which I highly uh, recommend. <clears throat> Another interesting feature is that the specific sins that are targeted in the early Christian tours of hell um, vary according to their social context. So, for example, the Apocalypse of Peter, which dates to the second century CE, it lists out punishments for those who are, who are worshiping idols and those who persecute Christians. And so there, and so there's this aspect of vengeance. Um, whereas if we fast forward to the fourth and fifth century CE with the with the uh, Apocalypse of Paul. You don't have these groups of, uh, of sinners, but now you have heretics, you have corrupt uh, clergy. And so here we are seeing how how hell is, is evolving, <coughs> excuse me, evolving to meet different social needs, i.e. here it's a lot more about um, a social control of, of, of beliefs as well as practice. Um, and this change in focus can be explained by how Christianity was becoming um, more established in the Roman Empire. In the second century CE, Christians are a minority that is being persecuted, but by the fourth and fifth century CE, Christians are now the movers and shakers. And so you don't have people targeted in, in, in a hell who are persecuting Christians, because in the Roman Empire, Christians are not being persecuted in the in the latter fourth and fifth century CE. And so I don't want to go into uh, into painful detail about these texts, especially because you know this talk is supposed to be about trauma. Um, <clears throat> But I do have a few recommended uh, books on the subject for people who are interested um, in some of the most uh, thorough research, I would say. So you can check those out. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I will say, like, as a person of faith who also researches these these texts, I do have a tentative uh, proposed model of what I think the afterlife might be like um, based upon these texts. Um, and so I do think that people who are loyal to 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 God as well as the vulnerable dead, there is a restful afterlife. I do think that particularly for, for people who have experienced trauma related to the afterlife, that apparently God cares about the vulnerable dead and that he can um, preserve their memories beyond death. I would also say that other people who could be in this category that I could think of were children, people who have experienced uh, mental illness, victims of abuse um, related to religious beliefs, as well as those who have never had the chance to ever hear about Christ, um, as well as people who are righteous of other faiths. Um, <clears throat> uh, I do think that God remembers those who are in this category, and that at the final judgment there is a, bo a bodily resurrection to everlasting life. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, I do feel that there is sufficient evidence to conclude that there is retribution of some form of restlessness or um, we aren't really told in the in the in the texts for those who were egregiously bad, those who were so bad they did not get what they deserved within life. Based on our ancient West Asian sources, I would say that the spirit of the deceased is wiped out, but that at the at the end of the time, apparently there is a resurrection of those who are uh, who deserve uh, some sort of retribution and. It, it's kind of a uh, a archetype, if you will, in some of our early Jewish texts that that at the final judgment, part of the punishment is basically to see the uh, the end game reversal at the at the last judgment. So those who had persecuted those who were faithful <coughs> to God are forced to to essentially watch as those that they had persecuted are raised to everlasting life. And then those in this category, they are devastated by it. And, you know, there's sadness. There's also anger. But it's not endless suffering. It's they eventually f just fade out. <clears throat> I'm not sure if there's a category um, that we saw in First Enoch chapter twenty-two for those who were who were wrongfully killed, um, Jesus might have assumed that his audience just knew about that text, and that was what he believed. But we can't really prove it. Um, <clears throat> I do feel quite strongly that there is a category. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that's not really well characterized of those who are quote unquote godless but who got what they deserve within life. And so it is not entirely clear of people in this category. I, I do think that as long as someone is remembered, they can have a restful uh, a restful afterlife with family and friends. But if someone is forgotten, does that mean that they just pass out of existence? Can they repent beyond death um, to experience uh, life? to transfer from this category into into this category? Can those in this category um, re, uh, preserve the, the memory of people who are in this category? Like, we just aren't told all these things that we, that we wish that we knew. Based upon uh, first, you know, 22, and if, if Jesus is referencing that framework in his parable of the rich man and, and Lazarus, I do think that for, that for those who got what they deserve within life and don't deserve any sort of uh, retribution, that they will not be raised at the final judgment because they've already gotten what they deserved. Um... So now kind of going on to the significance and innovation of my proposed model. Um, this is the importance for those who are victims of trauma is that I hope that I've shown it uh, good, well, well enough, is that this rhetoric of hell is not directed at victims of afterlife related trauma or anyone and everyone who doesn't believe something. <clears throat> the pastoral um, significance for those who are of faith is that it helps to uh, alleviate the emotional distress um, related to endless suffering. The importance for a kind of a philosophical, you know, uh, coherence of beliefs is that it helps to redress a philosophical problem of um, how is endless suffering a, a finite a punishment for any sort of evil, because even even the most you know terrible person can only commit a finite number of uh, sins. <clears throat> the innovation of this model is that it integrates the most advanced research on ancient Israelite as well as early Jewish uh, concepts of the afterlife in into the model, and what is innovative is that. I do think there is evidence for more than just two afterlife fates. And so I do want to touch upon briefly um, the kind of mental health sort of struggles that are 
that are related to the concept of, of hell. The, and I'm just speaking from my personal uh, experience as well as um, the experiences of people that I have read about. So one is setting healthy boundaries with people regarding the, the subject. Um, it may be tempting to try and just resolve it you know, quickly, but realistically that will not happen. Um, often people with this sort of trauma, it takes years for them to really like heal from it and not and to really feel that, that their life is not being uh, has this shadow cast on it by this uh, concept. The second piece of advice is to avoid um, church contexts that weaponize the the rhetoric of hell in order to <coughs> excuse me to traumatize people or to control people or to manipulate people to believe a certain way or to, or, or to act a certain way. Um, often there is a lot of pressure to continue going to certain churches um, either for the sake of just avoiding hell or because of people that are um, around the the person who is experiencing the uh, the uh, trauma, but but continuing to be in that abusive context often just makes the the trauma worse. <clears throat> what I think is more helpful is to connect with people who have had similar experiences and people who are either of faith or not who are loving and open minded, <clears throat> and. For me, as someone who does research in this area, I think that the most uh, important uh, way of of uh, of kind of tearing down the the trauma and the anxiety about this is to educate oneself about the history of of, of hell and various concepts, and to critically evaluate state. <coughs> Excuse me. To critically evaluate statements about its um, about the subject, and I do underline critically evaluate because so often the people who are in the abusive church context they are actively dis discouraged from thinking critically, and then often a huge part of the healing process is to help the trauma victim to reconstruct a a healthy sense of 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 self of not just <coughs> Excuse me. Um, not just adopting whatever some religious leader says, but getting them to to be able to critically evaluate what does the evidence show. And finally, for um, particularly severe cases, it may be necessary to work with a mental health professional to address the physiological responses to trauma. So you can think of like. You know, people's like chest feeling tight, their breathing quickening. Um, you know, those sorts of. Uh, whenever someone experiences trauma, it does, like re, rewire their like fear responses, and it, it conditions them to act a certain way um, towards a certain trigger, and in this case, that trigger is hell. So I won't spend too much time on my future research directions, um, but here they are in case someone is interested. Um, and finally, I would like to acknowledge um, several people, most of all my friend Riley, who inspires all of the research that I do, Rashio Christi Tamu for hosting me when I originally gave this talk, as well as all of the researchers who have contributed so much to our our, our understanding of how um, ancient Israelites, as well as early, early, early Jewish and Christian people thought about the afterlife. And yeah, that's my talk. Um, I hope that it helps people who have experienced trauma, as well as people who are just curious and want to think more carefully 